this is a continuation of uh, Huckabee, random clock talk. And uh, the thing we're going to talk about here at this uh, particular parcel of work is uh, making some gears. In the American Watchmakers Institute Clockmaker Certification Program for the Master uh, Clockmaker, the prospectus calls for making a pair of 64 tooth gears of brass or um, uh, aluminum, mounting these on um, uh, arbors, setting them up in, in uh, between uh, uh, bridges and uh, uh, pillars to space the bridges, and making the pinions and set these to running in uh, a little kind of do nothing mechanism, but to demonstrate the skill of the workman. What I'm going to do here, I hesitate to make the specific gears that uh, uh, the AWI calls for because if they fell into the hands of a uh, workman that uh, he might use those in a certification program and they not be in his own work. I'm going to make uh, a couple of gears from uh, an acrylic plastic here. Here is uh, three gear blanks that I sawed out. Uh, these are about <coughs> approximately an eighth of an inch uh, thick, and a little thinner than that, I suppose. Let's just uh, see what this is. And that's 70,000 to an inch thick. It's considerably less than an eighth. But I will uh, go through the process of making the gears in uh, acrylic plastic that will shorten the amount of time that's required in, in cutting the gears, but will demonstrate all of the uh, techniques that's required. I laid these out with a divider here a few minutes ago. I sawed out three of them. We'll saw one more to see what the sawing process uh, looks like. And uh, then we'll turn these blanks up to size and as time continues, I'll go through the process of uh, dimensioning the gears uh, as we machine them to size. This piece of uh, acrylic material here is scribed, and uh, you probably will not be able to see the center and the scribe line here. I saw the crowd. As a matter of fact, I'm having a little problem seeing the, the line myself. This camera is uh, very... Uh, it can see extremely well, and the light level that is suitable for me to work in is a bit too bright uh, for the camera. And that's the reason I have sawed down uh, the three of these lights before, that I might have a little uh, brighter uh, light. Now, we were talking about in a previous uh, random clock chat about the saw frame and the deep frame, the relative merits of the deep and the shallow. I've run out of space here. I'm into the back of the frame. Let's see how to take the, the blade out of the frame, or take the blade out of this uh, cut. Rather than backing out, we unhook the blade and uh, draw it out. And now we'll reinsert the, the blade in the frame. Just press it against the, the bench and hook back up. The reason for not drawing it out, if I pull backwards on this blade, pull from the back side that stretches the gullet of the teeth, and uh, has a high probability that uh, it will break. Got a little problem in getting this piece out of the uh, uh, raw material stock that I have. So let's go over here. I'll turn that upside down. We don't have that privilege to be on uh, working
the camera and go put a band-aid on my cut. We'll turn on again. We have the uh, the four blanks sawed out. Uh, the question is, if I need to make a, a gear or two, why do I cut four blanks? Well, pure and simple. Over the years, I usually, if I cut a gear for a specific purpose, I usually stack on a couple of extra blanks and lay these aside. Occasionally, particularly with escape wheels, I uh, occasionally reuse those. But uh, the real reason is as the gear cutter passes through the blank, it throws up a burr on the outside edge. If we have several blanks, then uh, the uh, inner pieces do not have a burr on them, and uh, that says that we can cast aside the ones that does have the burn, and then we have perfect cut gears. I'll take these over to the drill press and, and uh, drill the holes in them, and then we'll set that up in the lathe and, and uh, uh, turn them to size. Let's reach over here in this lathe and, and pick the uh, arbor that I'll be using, and uh, Let me take this, uh, uh, trying to find this, let's move the camera a little. All right, here is the uh, dividing head that I will use in uh, cutting this uh, uh, gear. We'll take this arbor uh, out and uh, take a look at it and see what the uh, objectives are. Cut off 
off the camera and make a set up on the lathe. And we'll be back in a few moments and and uh, deal with this. You saw me saw the end and saw into the end of my finger there a few minutes ago. That's the first time I've done that in, in many years. And uh, I thought it was kind of humorous while I continued to uh, uh, to saw. I was trying to hide the, the bleeding from the camera. And uh, in the process of hurrying up to finish, I didn't get that last blank. I, I couldn't see the lines very well. I didn't get the last blank size very well. But as we turn that on the uh, uh, lathe, we'll, we'll correct that situation. And when I cut the camera off, <coughs> holding that uh, uh, finger down, kind of hiding it out of uh, view here, and uh, I looked down and I had a uh, puddle of uh, uh, blood about, about that big on this uh, vinyl tile floor where that uh, finger was bleeding. It was quite a surprise to me. Uh, I thought that I just nicked it and really the cut wasn't very bad, but it goes to show you that uh, you never get too old for an accident. All right, I'm going to uh, pull the, uh, the lathe over in this area and we'll continue with the test uh, with the demonstration in a couple of moments. Here on the camera, <coughs> we're uh, uh, back to the point that we're going to do a little machine work. We're going to machine these blanks to size. And uh, a little comment along the way, uh, one of my friends was looking at one of these uh, Huckabee clock talk, random clock talk tapes uh, a few days ago, and he says, why do you uh, usually go into detail of explaining your errors or mistakes or whatever as you go along the way? And uh, the reply was simply this. <coughs> My objective is not to give you a pure sterile teaching, but uh, to let the viewer see how it is, see how the things go, see that there is no, no workman that is perfect, that uh, we continually strive to uh, uh, the end that uh, we're going after. Let's look at this and uh, see about what the uh, gross diameter of this uh, is going to be. We're in the order of about 1.4 inches uh, in the rough. And uh, we'll take a <coughs> cut across this. Plastic, if you've never machined plastic, you'll get a surprise of your life on, on that. Uh, we find that we want a half melt and, and uh, half um, my cut. I'm having a little problem here with the uh, melting of it. I'm going to have to re reduce the uh, uh, speed. We'll unlatch the, the uh, counter shaft back here and move up to a larger pulley. <coughs> and support that. Uh, speed is considerably slower. Matter of fact, uh, I'm less than half the speed that I was going uh, previously. <coughs> Take a few cuts off. This tool bit has a very slight uh, round nose.
pieces. I think we are on a uh, couple of them. And see what we have. I'm uh, 1.368 inch at this point. And uh, the 
uh, intense light that we have here is the intensity of the sun that's passing through a heavy blue uh, uh, window curtain. And it seems to be moderating a little bit, and uh, I had to wait about uh, uh, 10 or almost 15 minutes here uh, even to get down to this level. Let's see what we have now. Uh, we're sitting on uh, 1 inch 320, and we're going for 1 inch 299.
can uh, smooth this off and uh, see what we can do here. Get some of this. Uh, oh, I tell you, this this final cut here is as fine as uh, <laughs> annual hair, and it's wound all around and everything on here. Try to get that off. It's in the bearings of the lathe. And if you're not careful, if you take a deep breath, it'll go up your nose. That's a, a problem in, in cutting uh, plastic. Let's find the place that we did not clear up. Uh, it's right there. And I believe one more thousandth of an inch would have cleared that. And we probably will not be able to find that when that gear is made. We'll remove this. And as we cut the uh, uh, teeth, we will cut from uh, uh, the back side down. That is from this back side down so we can pull against this backup piece. As heavy as this stack is, it would be perfectly feasible to, uh, to uh, enter these blanks from either direction. There's, uh, this is quite sturdy. It's not as if we were cutting uh, one or two or three pieces of very thin, uh, uh, for instance, brass stock. So, I'll uh, turn off the uh, camera here and clean up some of this, uh, uh, all this fuzz around here, and we'll uh, discuss the uh, ear cutting uh, engine. If we uh, look at these uh, cutters, this is really a profile saw. It's a, it's a saw that has the, the tooth profile that uh, corresponds to the area that is removed from the uh, uh, gear blank. If we look at one of the larger ones here, we find that the uh, uh, inscription here is D17-20 and M0.8. This says that this is module uh, 0.8 and D is for teeth, dents, and uh, that this cutter is suitable for cutting a, a gear with a tooth count of 17, 18, 19, or 20 teeth. We're looking for one to cut the 64 teeth in um, uh, 0.5 module. This cutter uh, is labeled D1416 module 0.5. That says that this is a pinion cutter. Cuts 14, 15, or 16 uh, tooth pinions. We have one here. This is the cutter that uh, that we will use. This is, is module uh, 0.50 D55-134. It says that this is suitable for cutting a wheel that has uh, a tooth range anywhere from 55 to 134 inclusive. We will uh, load this cutter up on the uh, uh, wheel cutting engine, and it's the one that we will use for the uh, uh, for the job that we have at hand. Let me uh, turn off here and pick up the, the pieces, and we'll go a little further. Going further in the uh, uh, process of making a wheel, I've slipped into the uh, headstock the cutter that uh, we will be using. Uh, this is the uh, uh, cutter placed on, a, on an arbor. This is a, a stub arbor. And uh, the cutter is here with the teeth pointing in this direction, around uh, this direction so that it will be cutting down with the uh, normal uh, operation of the lathe. This is in the headstock. We may have a problem when we make the setup right in this right in this area. In cutting a large wheel, we cannot get the small cutter in deep enough without the wheel touching the frame of the uh, the bearing frame of the lathe. That says that uh, we may have to uh, move the cutter out, uh, uh, space it out, if we have a problem in this particular setup. I, I believe that in, in uh, the gear of the size that we're going to cut, this is going to be all right. 
uh, it is preferable to run the cutter just as close to the headstock as you possible, possibly can to suppress uh, chatter. We need to uh, uh, be sure that the bearings are uh, uh, well off. Put in the, the uh, favorite uh, red lube that uh, we use here. Now, next, we set on the familiar tool slide rest. We have the, the naked tool holder without its raising uh, uh, rings there. And let's, uh, <coughs> let's look at this tool a bit. This is the index plate that we'll be using. Uh, possibly we can pick up at some point here, possibly right right there. We can see the series of holes around the plate. This is the index pin. That pin is, is uh, withdrawn and then the uh, plate can be turned. This uh, index plate is on the, the rear end of a shaft and uh, a very close fitting bearing in this central region. That bearing is the full length uh, of this uh, uh, portion of the tool. Then on here we have the uh, gear blank, uh, blanks that uh, we cut uh, just earlier in this uh, film. This is hooked up with the uh, uh, down stop on it. We will actually mount this in this direction and we will cut downward. We will cut downward, pulling down uh, on this against the backup uh, uh, plate. The hand crank here sets the height. This is a, a height adjustment on this. Let's turn the lathe around and, and uh, mount this piece of the wheel cutting engine. Set in the naked tool post, drop this over it, and uh, here we put in a substantial uh, uh, tool bit as a crossbar, uh, as a hold down, and we pull up and we use the tool post right through, uh, right through this uh, attachment to carry us down. Let's slip this off and, and uh, look at it a little further. This down feed will be the, the uh, uh, portion of the tool that we will use to feed the cutter, feed the uh, blank through the cutter. We will be feeding the, the gear blank through the cutter. This, uh, 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 these two cranks, normal cranks on the, the tool slide, the horizontal and longitudinal cranks, will simply be used to uh, uh, make the uh, uh, setup. This latch is on, on the draw bolt, and this brings the uh, watchmaker's uh, lathe to a full-fledged full -fledged, uh, tool cutting uh, engine. We turn it around this way. I'm looking, uh, my view at this point is directly into the uh, uh, headstock spindle, the outside end of the, the uh, headstock. The cutter is right in, in this region and it will cut down through through the gear blanks at this point. We will actually control the depth of the cut with the uh, see if we can get this in the in the illustration. We will actually control the depth of the cut with this speed. I'm backing the blank, backing the blank away from the cutter or pulling it up to the cutter. We will control the um, entry of the cutter toward the axis of rotation of the finished gear with the crank that is on the, um, the longitudinal feed here. We want the cutter as it enters into the blank to enter directly in to the axis of rotation. Otherwise, the teeth that we cut will either be leaning uh, forward or, or reverse. It's very important that we uh, uh, get that uh, facet of this in order. The thing that we will do is 
raise this entire assembly with the crank. We will raise it uh, uh, up full high. Then we will carry it back and we will look at a center. There is a center, a sharp uh, center on the end of this arbor here. We will carry that back. And we will center that center point directly over the center of the cutter. Now, once we do that, we will uh, uh, take a, uh, a screwdriver and we'll lock up the, uh, the gibs in, in the tool slide. We'll lock them up, lock the cutter up, uh, lock the, the cranks up in the gibs so that everything remains tight against the chatter. We will pull in the depth here. We'll pull the depth in and to find the depth in a cycloidal um, uh, gear when we're cutting, we must size the blank in uh, just in absolute terms. You recall that we size this blank to uh, uh, one inch, two hundred ninety-nine thousandths of an inch, because we're using the OD of that blank, the, the outer diameter of that blank, as a reference point for the depths of our teeth. When we make the first pass through here, we cut some subjective depth. We will re release the index pin, which is underneath. We will turn the, the index plate one tooth, and we will make another gear, pa another cutter pass. When we make the second cutter pass, we look at the teeth. The we must continue this process and adjusting the depth until we bring the cycloidal tooth to a knife edge on top. That sets the proper depth. Uh, consequently, from that you can see that if we miss the blank diameter, we spoil the whole gear system. The whole, the whole thing will go in error. So the blank must be sized in uh, just to absolute terms. Absolute meaning uh, within uh, uh, a gear of this size, plus or minus uh, two or three thousandths of an inch. Uh, in this particular case, we have this blank right on the theoretical uh, uh, dimension, right to the thousandth of an inch. It takes a little jockeying around to get this together. I'll turn this around and we'll begin to make the, uh, uh, make the adjustments that's required uh, to get there. First thing, let's get the uh, uh, cutter lined up on the axis of the gear blank. We have to bring this up just about as high as we can possibly go and uh, in reality there I can't even get that high enough. So we'll have to resort to uh, uh, something else here. All right. Let me uh, get out front and uh, slide back through this. We want to wind up with this directly over our draw bolt. That's where this this will be the most uh, sturdy, and um, uh, we'll tighten that. Uh, up at that's that point. Now, the thing I will have to do in order to uh, uh, get this uh, alignment that I'm speaking of, I'm going to have to loosen the uh, base of our cutter back out a little more and tip this to a side and point this uh, toward the uh, uh, the cutter. That will allow me to get my uh, center pointer centered on the cutter. Now recall that once we do this, we will never move this slide. I'll lock up. I'll lock up the, uh, the total uh, compound assembly. We'll lock that up. We'll never move it again until the gear is finished. Now, I have to look into the rear of this. Let's see if possibly we can see in here from, from the camera. <laughs> There we go. 
I don't think that the, the camera will be able to see the specific thing that I'm looking for, but uh, you can get the idea of what it is. We have this, the, this center right here. That's the, the center of the arbor, this hole in the blanks. We have it pointed toward the gear. Now, I'll have to get down here with an eye loop. I want to look at the face of that gear, gear cutter right out at the tip and get those centered up. So, let me see if I can uh, get my head in there. And uh, uh, take a look. Well, I've got a problem here. I've got a reflection through my window of the light. And I can't see in that dark area with my eye loop. can't see in there with the uh, with the eye loop. Let me cut the camera off. I'll turn this around at an, another angle. And make We had the camera off there for a couple of minutes. I have it back on. And uh, I'm using a uh, different eye loop. Let me uh, show you this uh, eye loop if I can get it into the uh, picture. I suppose that's uh, my favorite uh, watchmaker's eye loop. Uh, I purchased this uh, as an apprentice watchmaker for, I don't know, about 50 or 75 cents many years ago. And I had a lot of problem uh, looking through it. Uh, put it in your eye, take it off, in your eye, take it off. And uh, the old craftsman that was guiding me at that period of time told me, he said, look son, he says, take your saw and saw this thing away so that it's uh, just a skeleton. And I did, the, the jeweler saw and I've cut away. Uh, quite a number of holes. Now, here's the, the beauty of, of using that particular eye loop. You can stick that thing in your eye, uh, pull up close, uh, see through the loop, or you can look out through the sides and see at a little greater distance without it. That's the thing that I used uh, looking in this. Now, I'll take one more uh, look, see if we're okay. And uh, I'm looking right here, looking right there, and I have the, the center. This is this is a very sharp point center. It's pointing to the tip of that cutter. Now, from this point on, we will uh, we will never touch we will never touch the uh, uh, the, the crank that we can see. Well, it's it's the it's uh, this this crank uh, here. This one. We'll never touch that again, and we want to lock that up uh, with the uh, uh, gibbs so that uh, uh, so that we uh, can't move that, and neither will the, the tool chatter. Turn this around again. I would counsel you if you ever get into this type of uh, work. There goes my cap in the picture again. I would uh, counsel you to uh, to always mount your lathe on some type of base that can be moved around. Let's zoom this lens down just a just a mite here. All right. I'm uh, looking to tighten tighten the gibbs uh, here in the lathe. I need a smaller screwdriver. Let me turn off and locate the tool. Back we'll tighten the gibbs in this. We want this to be. Uh, uh, chatter free and the cutting that we're doing. We tighten that one, that screw, and uh, we tighten that one. Now we have this uh, uh, this direction of our compound uh, uh, tightened up. We will want this one to be tightened up when we find the uh, ultimate position. We want uh, the uh, vertical slide uh, to be fairly readily movable but uh, uh, very snug. It's important that we do this in order to suppress the uh, uh, chatter that may occur. If a tool bit chatters, if the tool bit, the cutter, the rotary cutter, if the cutter chatters as uh, the cut is being made, it will make the cut wider than the breadth of the tool. 
If we make the cut wider than the breadth of the tool, it makes the teeth narrower than they should be. Remember, we're removing space, not uh, teeth. So uh, if that uh, tool chatters just for a moment while you're cutting, you're in trouble on the profile of the teeth. Let's turn this back around. Okay. Now, on this, we have a zero marker. The zero marker to show us uh, when we're vertical. And I have to pull in here to uh, like that. And we'll tighten this up without uh, uh, any movement. And double check to see that we didn't slip. And we're okay. All right. <coughs> As we pull in, we should be correct that the tool is centered on the blank. We need to run down here. Take this down, and we will go below. We will take the, uh, the blank below the um, uh, cutter. We'll pull in further. Let's uh, come up and see about what it looks like that cut is going to be. Uh, looks like that may be close to the position. I need to slack this, this give just a, a tiny amount here. And uh, there's a reason that I'm doing this. I go to great detail to tell you how firm that it should be. But uh, if we have problems turning this, we can flex. We can flex uh, the uh, tool system. Now, I can shake this just a little bit, but uh, the thing that you're seeing there is this. See, if I pull down on, out here on the uh, tip end of the lathe bed, I'm flexing the base that I'm sitting on, but there's still a little flex uh, in this uh, uh, system. Now, I want this so that as I turn this, and I don't stress uh, the uh, tool enough to flex that. Uh, we want to keep this pure, even down to uh, a thousandth of an inch or less. Continuing here. I'm uh, turning easier there. And uh, looks like that we're all right. We're uh, ready to uh, begin the, uh, the cutting. Back off here just a little bit more. Now I don't know if we can get this in a position, possibly that we can see where the uh, uh, cut is being made. Look at this on the camera. The, the business place that we're looking for is right here. I'll try another color pointer. Maybe you can see better. That doesn't do very well either. Let's uh, try this red pencil. Look for the ferrule uh, on the pencil. Right in this, right in this area is where the cut is going on. Now, from my vantage point, from my vantage point, I can look right here. Look right down this pencil. I can see where that uh, cut is going to be made. I'm not sure that we can in the uh, camera. Let's. Um, uh, Let's try looking a little bit closer and see if it would help. Oh, no, we began to go out of uh, focus there. And uh, I think that's uh, I think that's about as good as we can do. All right, as we make the cut, <coughs> we need to lubricate this liberally. Uh, we need to run the uh, uh, cutter at a speed at which we get the least vibration and uh, uh, the uh, least amount of heating on the part. Let's start the motor. My uh, vertical belt back here, you can see my hand on the vertical belt, is uh, pretty tight at this point. I'm going to let my counter shaft down just a little bit. Let's try that. You notice that the noise from the lane is uh, uh, not nearly uh, so great. Let's 
look at this uh, uh, belt here. I think that that's uh, satisfactory. This belt on the back side uh, is a little critical on uh, tension. This is a miniature V-belt and it has a glass fiber carcass. It has absolutely zero stretch. And consequently, the uh, spacing on it is, is uh, pretty critical. The rawhide belt that we have up here uh, is so pliable that it, and also being longer, it is more uh, tolerant on uh, uh, tank. Let's look in this situation now. And you can hear the cut beginning to run here. I've passed through the blank and I need to uh, look at this and see what the depth of the cut looks like. I have to go considerably deeper. Let's uh, put the oil to it. We'll leave this oil all the way around uh, uh, on the flat surface so that uh, the little uh, bit of uh, trimmer that it has will work it off onto the, uh, onto the teeth and pull the start switch.
to go to the next position, I must pull the index pin, which is underneath here, and my feel, I go to the next index hole, and I press that pin in tight so that it's uh, well seated. We uh, uh, distribute the oil back around to that uh, position. Cut another two.
for the store bought teeth, the kind my wife uses for the real teeth. Let's see how this this looks. We'll get this about as dry as we can uh, uh, here. And uh, let me inspect this with the eye loop now. I find the uh, the teeth are brought to uh, the knife edge, as uh, we discussed uh, earlier. Uh, that says that we are the right depth uh, in the cutter, and uh, they look good all over. Now, we need to disassemble this thing and get these apart and look at them. They should uh, uh, run and mesh with each other, and uh, we'll see if we can get the camera up closer to uh, uh, look at them. I think I'll turn around and, and knock down the uh, uh, setup so that you can see the things that uh, go on there. To disassemble uh, the setup, you have to have the, the key. And this is a part of my way it is operation. Misplaced my uh, key for the uh, two post. Here's the index head made by Boley, made by Boley of Germany. And uh, I've had this for quite years. We have the tool slide, the dial gauge. This is uh, uh, a Japanese import dial gauge. Uh, this is commonly found in the machine tool industry, not in the uh, uh, among the watchmakers and clockmakers. Uh, we have the the three-level tool slide made by Hamel Riglander Company. I believe I bought this through uh, uh, C and E Marshall uh, quite a number of years ago. Uh, they obviously purchased it from Hamel Riglander because it has the HR trademark on it. Uh, the, the blocks, the block that you see on the end, which I mount the um, uh, dial gauges in, I added those um, those blocks uh, later. I had to form cut these to, uh, maybe I can get a little better in focus here. I had to form cut these blocks to clear the uh, T-bolt uh, here and set these up the shape that's made out of uh, blocks of brass and the dial gauge goes in there and rides uh, the end of the slide. The block on uh, this one is about the same thing. You find that it's held on with a single screw and a dial pin. This dial pin, uh, uh, this particular slide is thin down in this area because we're below the dovetail and there was not enough space for thread. So this is a larger screw and a dial pin. This holds the dial gauge there. These uh, things have been uh, uh, added. We uh, look at the uh, uh, headstock, and as we look at the, the headstock, this is uh, an arbor, and I'm not uh, I'm not sure where uh, I'm not sure of the origin of this arbor. Maybe it has a trademark on it that we could take a take a look. Uh, I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe I ordered this arbor directly from uh, Boley and Lenin in uh, Germany. Boley products cannot be purchased uh, in the United States except through uh, a franchised uh, American importer. But uh, Boley and Lenin products can be ordered uh, directly from Germany, which I did in this case, and in uh, some of the uh, things such as this uh, chuck here, which is a Boley and Lenin chuck. We see the the uh, cuttings. It's on the bed of the, the lathe here. This uh, kind of stuff is not uh, not abrasive in the plastics. It's a nuisance to get on your hands, but uh, it's not all that uh, big a deal. Let's tighten this up here and uh, take out our uh, uh, newly cut uh, gears and look at them. I lay into this pretty tightly when uh, we go to cut gears because if we make a slip, everything is lost. All right. Um, these were sketchy.
end tight on here. We take these apart, take a look, and smooth the lathe again. We uh, uh, look at these things. We have uh, nice little gears that uh, uh, roll uh, correctly in, in mesh with each other. Now what we'll do, see we got four of these. Uh, remember that when we started, we were looking for one or two, what have you. But you get your extra copies almost for free. What we'll do, we'll clean up the bench here a little. Uh, see if I can get some colored background paper that we can uh, put behind these. Get on a closer lens of the camera. And uh, let's see if we can inspect these uh, more closely. Let's do a little more talk on these uh, uh, gears. This is the four pieces that we cut in the stack. Remember that they're 0.5 uh, uh, module and uh, they're 64 teeth. And uh, as we look, you see the the, uh, the oil and the cutting on uh, cuttings on my hands here. But and the the uh, gears themselves are still uh, quite uh, oily. But let's uh, talk about this situation a little. The uh, uh, pitch circle of this gear is um, uh, 0.5 module, which is a half of a millimeter, times 64 teeth, and uh, uh, that uh, is is dialed in right here on this gauge, and that is almost the total diameter of the gear. That's 260 thousandths of an inch. Being that these two um, uh, gears are the same diameter if we mesh the two together, the center distances that they should operate on is also 260 thousandths of an inch or uh, 64 millimeters. 32 millimeters, half modules, half of that distance. Uh, if you could see, and maybe I can turn this around, let's get this to where we can uh, uh, not bottom this, this out. We're sitting on uh, 260 on the uh, uh, dial here, 260 thousandths. This is a 60, a 1 inch 260, uh, the 1 inch and the 2. And we go here, and the center distances, the proper center distance that these should operate on is uh, uh, to uh, 260. I can't uh, quite see and get down in that. But that's uh, what the situation is. Maybe across this way we could uh, uh, see it. Right there is the center distance that uh, we should run on. We find many times in making gears for a clock that we have to make a gear to mesh with an existing uh, uh, pinion or a wheel, if we make a pinion to mesh with a wheel, that is at an already predetermined center distance. We go from the center distances and the ratios up to the diameter that uh, we cut the blank to make the uh, wheels. Uh, if you're particularly interested in that, a book that I would recommend to you that uh, uh, lays this out uh, pretty nicely is called Gears for Small Mechanisms by W. O. Davis. Uh, Mr. Davis is dead. Uh, his uh, first edition of this book was uh, sometime immediately after World War II. Mr. Davis worked for uh, the instrument industry over in uh, England. The uh, uh, book was published by National Association of Goldsmiths, the NAG Press of London, and it's gears for small mechanisms. That book went out of uh, uh, all the copies were sold out by about uh, 19 and uh, 58 or 59 or 60, somewhere thereabout. The first time that I uh, saw a copy of the uh, Gears for Small Mechanisms was in the engineering library of IBM. I was employed by IBM as a, an electrical engineer, that is a magnetics engineer, uh, for almost 40 years. I found that book, uh, Gears for Small Mechanisms, in the uh, uh, IBM Engineering Library. I was uh, so infatuated with it that uh, I set forth a search to uh, uh, get a copy of it. And after a number of years of uh, search, 
uh, Mrs. Uh, Higgins of Robert's Book Company, uh, the wife, uh, Mrs. Josephine Higgins, wife of uh, uh, Orville Higgins, the well-known horologist, found me a copy through some uh, friend or search agency in England. And uh, I purchased the book at uh, a very substantial price because of the shipping and all the things that was involved with it. But that's been the greatest piece of instruction that I've ever had uh, on uh, gear making for small mechanisms. Uh, there is very little left remaining to be desired in understanding uh, uh, small gears. Uh, some years later, the uh, uh, book was republished, and uh, in the republication, uh, Mr. Davis, uh, still being a uh, member of the instrument uh, industry and associated with uh, gears for that industry, directed the uh, book more away from horological type of gearing to uh, that of uh, uh, meters, like uh, water meters, electric meters, uh, instrument recording devices, and things of that type. That book, I understand, is uh, still available. It is the second edition. Uh, I have a copy of it. It is very good, but uh, it is not as, uh, not as fine a work for the horologist as uh, the first edition of uh, Mr. Davis' book. But uh, that is a, a text that uh, will probably do you more good in understanding small gearing than uh, all of the other texts that I have ever been able to amass on uh, uh, gear cutting. Uh, these, uh, these little gears, I regret that I didn't uh, make them from uh, some darker colored plastic. I suppose I wouldn't have because I didn't have a piece. But uh, if we could see them, it, uh, uh, if the camera could see them, it would improve our perspective and uh, understanding of them. In the uh, uh, certified clockmakers uh, 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 prospectus by the AWI, you're required to cut a pair of these, uh, fit the uh, uh, arbors to them, uh, a mating pinion, and uh, establish that in uh, working relationship between uh, some plates. The use of a gear is still another subject matter, and uh, uh, how that we mount the gear has a great deal to do with the success of its operation. You recall that when we were uh, making this blank, I had this hole skin tight, absolutely skin tight on the arbor. Uh, to the best of the tools that I have, this bore is concentric with the OD of the gear. But in reality, and uh, in, in uh, all reasonable thought, there is a little concentricity error between these two. Now the way I like to uh, uh, mount a gear on an arbor, uh, when I mount a gear on, on an arbor, I always like to make a new hub. And uh, the, uh, uh, my, my process, if, if uh, things permit, is to uh, make a new hub, turn it into rough, a little larger in diameter, a little larger in diameter than this uh, uh, bore that the hub is to go in. Then I set that arbor in a dead center lathe, in a dead center operation, and I turn the hub. Now that says that that hub will be absolutely dead true to the pivots on the arbor. It doesn't make any difference if there's any error in the ar arbor, whatever it might be, I am dead true to the pivots. Then I take the wheel, this wheel, and uh, I put it in uh, what's called turning in a box. This is an old trick that I learned a, a long time ago. Uh, on a face plate or on a, uh, a large cement brass or uh, on the face of a chuck or whatever that you can chuck up in the, in the lathe, you place on there a little piece of wood, a little piece of plywood, uh, uh, a quarter inch thick plywood will do well. You can screw it on, you can glue it on with uh, 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 
shellac, uh, many ways, whatever, ever how you want to fasten it onto the uh, to the face plate. You might even put it on with double double back, uh, double sticky back uh, tape, and then go into that uh, little thin piece of wood, and with the lathe turn a pocket, and you turn that pocket so that this wheel will just slip into the pocket. It will just slip in it with the ever so slightest uh, interference. This is to go in the pocket. That's called the box. And when you sink that in there to the depth, about as deep as uh, the pocket needs to be about as deep as the gear is thick, I just lick my finger and wipe it around the edge of the gear at the pocket like that. That is ever, ever so slightly moist and within 30 seconds time this wheel will be locked in a dead true pocket. Now I go inside the bore with a boring bar and I skin this bore out to the point that I can just fit the arbor and the hub that I've turned, that I can just slip that arbor in this. Now when I have uh, used this process, you will find that the periphery of the gear is absolutely concentric to the pivots that it's going to run on. I've tried many methods of mounting wheels and getting uh, wheels true, but uh, there is a, essentially none essentially no other method that I have ever found that will approach that uh, in accuracy. Now, another thing you can do is the uh, bezel chuck. We looked at this in uh, some earlier uh, random clock talk tapes. Uh, this bezel chuck here uh, on these ID jaws has um, uh, no more than uh, uh, one or possibly two thousandths of an inch indicated run out on these inside jaws. Of all the chucks that I've ever owned, I've never owned one that runs as true as uh, this uh, bezel chuck. In many cases, and particularly in the bigger uh, wheels, I catch those in the uh, bezel chuck right by the teeth, catch them gently, and uh, then I bore the, uh, the ID of the uh, gear in that and then use the same technique of fitting up on the hub. Now, if things permit and you look at this in advance, if you're replacing a gear and you have the original hub uh, and there is enough uh, material there, I usually cut that original hub ever so slightly smaller and then I size this hole right up front. Right to begin with, I began with a smaller hole so that I can fit that back onto the hub that is already on the shaft. Now that's some techniques of um, uh, wheel mounting. Possibly in a, another tape uh, at a later time we'll mount a wheel and see how to do this and how to uh, uh, get that straight. Well, what you've seen today is the process of, uh, of making a gear uh, the process where that you would design one, uh, cut one, and um, uh, finish it ready to be mounted on the uh, on the arbor of a clock or some instrument that uses uh, small gears. The process is long and tedious. I uh, glanced on this uh, tape here a few minutes ago. It uh, looks like that I've used about an, uh, an hour and uh, 20 or 30 minutes of actual uh, recording time. There's been uh, a good bit of uh, uh, setup that was made that was not on the tape, and there's been a good bit of talk on the tape that uh, could have been turned into setup. So what it would have mounted to uh, is probably an hour and a half that it would require for me to make these uh, uh, these four gears from scratch. So it's it's not an easy thing. It's not an inexpensive process. But if there is no gear available and uh, the need is great enough, this is certainly the way to go. Uh, it's a highly rewarding uh, uh, job that is to your uh, ego. Uh, this is the type of job, this type of work that I enjoy doing. And uh, really, the uh, the great thrill comes when this has been mounted on a shaft on an arbor and uh, on those pivots and that hub prepared in the manner that I have told you and riveted in place and you find that that true that gear run 
runs or uh, that wheel runs dead true in both flat and round. You know that you're a, a highly skilled craftsman when you see that end. Uh, this is uh, uh, J.M. Huckabee at the J.B. Ranch uh, near Austin, Texas, just outside the north uh, outskirts of Austin, Texas. Uh, certified master clockmaker and fellow uh, with the BHI. My clockmaker certification is with the American Watchmakers Institute. Uh, this is a, a type of thing that is, is required in um, uh, clockmaker certification with the AWI for the master clockmaker. Uh, the uh, certified clockmaker requirements are considerably less. If you're a clockmaker, you look at this tape, I would encourage you to get in touch with uh, AWI and get a prospectus of uh, uh, what certification requires and what it's all about. Uh, it is uh, uh, the mark of a high level of craftsmanship.